folks, Dr. Mike Israel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, RPU, Lecture 7, Adjusting Timing, Food Composition, and Supplements During Your Fat Loss Diet. So we know the basics of how these things work. Let's talk about how we're going to adjust them as we move through the diet. We're going to start with timing adjustments. Here, it's super important to say the following up front. We have a situation where we already know optimal timing and how it should work from earlier lectures. These adjustments we're going to make now are not for optimum nutritional physiological timing usually. They're more for real world concerns, practical considerations, and to deal with psychology and hunger. So timing, number one kind of adjustment you might do is you might eat later after waking than normal. Typically, on a maintenance phase, on a, mu a muscle gain phase, you might wake up and then in 15 minutes have breakfast. But a lot of folks seem to not be super hungry in the morning. Some people are very hungry in the morning and they would never do this. But some individuals can wake up and for, gee, at least an hour, maybe two, maybe longer, just really not want to eat. Now, here's the thing. You have a certain amount of calories to squeeze into your day. And as you cut those calories, hunger can really start to skyrocket. But if you make your day of eating shorter by condensing the calories into a shorter time span, you will be less hungry during that time. But you could say, of course, but you'll be more hungry during the time that you're not eating. Yeah, unless that time's in the morning, you're just not a morning eater anyway. Imagine how ridiculous it is to wake up and eat oatmeal and eggs and turkey bacon and stuff yourself and be like, Ugh. and then later in the middle of the day, be starving to death and have your chicken breast and, and rice. And you're like, damn it, I wish I had double this. Wouldn't it be cool to move your breakfast up two hours so that you're full for longer so that by the time it comes to eat your chicken breast and rice, you can eat it two hours earlier and be like, oh, wow, I'm not even like super hungry for my last meal. Oh, it's time to eat my chicken and rice. And then you're never really hungry during the day or much less so. So sometimes what you can do is eat later after you wake up. And that way you give yourself a buffer zone of uh, not having to be as hungry. Right? Because you might be a little hungry even an hour or two after you wake up, but you can bear it. Another cool thing psychologically, which tends to work pretty well uh, for many people, is the idea of front-loading difficulty. And this is something that I actually think works in life in general. Um, get the tough stuff done early so that the day gets better as it goes. If you eat a crap load, most of your food early in the day, and then you eat less and less food as you, as the day goes on, you like have to look forward to more and more misery. It's hard to get motivated like that. And it's easy to crack. You sort of start to get hungry at 5 PM and you know, for a fact, you don't go to bed until 11. Like if I'm hungry now by 11, I'm going to be eating my own limbs. And then so you drive by a pizza place and you're like, you know what? Fuck it. Fuck this diet. I'm just going to eat pizza. Let's I'm only alive once shorter time if I eat pizza too much, but uh, so that's definitely a consideration, but here's the thing. If you wake up and you're already kind of like, nah, I could just eat or not eat. And you don't eat for an hour and that's okay. But you don't eat for another hour and you're a little hungry when you start eating, you're like, oh wow. Like I already put in two hours of not eating. This is sweet. The rest of the day is easier. So when you wake up and you know, you have two hours ahead of you to not eat, you're like, psychologically it works because you're like, sweet, let's get this done. And then I, and then things get easier, Right. At almost any time that you're involved in something difficult, it's usually best, of course, after a little warm up period to get the hard stuff done early, right? So that you can not coast all the way through, but it's super motivating to know that every bit of work you do, it's just going to get easier from here on in versus get harder, right? So that's a big deal. Is it going to alter the optimality of your nutrient partitioning, so on and so forth? Yes, sure. It's going to cause a little bit more muscle loss risk, but remember nothing beats adherence. And if your hunger is getting so intense that it's uh, getting to adherence problems or setting some up for af the after the diet period, that's totally worth it to move the meal by a couple hours here and there. So that's the last time actually in this entire talk, I'm going to address the optimality trade-off. Yes, for all of these adjustments, there are optimality trade-offs, but they're usually really, really small. And the adherence and hunger benefits that you gain are usually really, really big. So if you don't have hunger problems or adherence problems, don't do any of these. Don't adjust any of these. But if you do, especially if they're moderate to severe problems with hunger and adherence, for sure make these adjustments because they're worth it. Nobody cares if you traded off a, a quarter of a pound of muscle on your diet you lost 20 pounds of fat because you manage hunger properly versus if you didn't lose that quarter pound of muscle, but you lost only eight pounds because you have failed halfway through the diet, right? Really, really big difference. 
Point number two where you can alter is you can eat closer to workouts. That is, you have a workout here, here's the beginning of the day, instead of eating here, you might be able to eat here. Why? Because sometimes eating closer to workout, especially if you're running on empty, can give you just enough energy to have a really, really good workout. Normally, your glycogen's full, you're not starving to death, you're on a muscle gain plan or maintenance plan, Eating three hours before workout, you have tons of energy, plus you're eating a lot of food, and if you eat any closer than three hours, you might just throw up all over the place. But now that you've been dieting for a while, you might take that three-hour window and close it to two hours, because if you tried to eat three hours away, by the time one hour away or the workout got in, you're starving and you're low on energy because your body has burned through all that food. It's less food, it's easier to burn through, and your glycogen levels aren't as full and your hunger hormones are going crazy. So if you move it to two hours, you might still have lots of energy, have a great workout, and then uh, great workouts fuel better fat loss, muscle retention, so on and so forth. So that's definitely an option. Another thing you can do is you can remove the workout shake point number three, completely and use whole food instead. Now, that doesn't mean you eat a carrot and a piece of chicken during your workout. You just don't have an intra workout shake anymore. Remember, intra workout shakes are a tiny optimality increaser. They increase by a fraction of several several percentage points at the most, I mean, at the most, usually a fraction of a percentage point. And it's nice to have, right? But when you need calories to keep you not hungry, wasting them on liquid protein and liquid carbs in your workouts. Remember, you're not hungry in your workouts anyway. Your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, is driving. You're not hungry. You're you're working, right? And for a couple of hours after, you're probably not hungry. We'll get to that in, in just a sec. So basically, uh, you're in a situation where you have this 20 grams of protein and 30 grams of carbs in your shake. You could use it for no good reason, for, for the reason of optimizing your workout that gives a tiny little bit of percent improvement during the workout, or you could take the 20 grams of carbs, sorry, 20 grams of protein, 30 grams of carbs, spread it to whole foods to your other meals, maybe to the ones during which you're most hungry and feel least full, and all of a sudden, your overall daily anti-hunger fight is much more enhanced, right? Because 30 grams of Gatorade disappears like it was never there. 30 grams of carbs from small to medium-sized apples is two apples. You add two apples to your brown rice with your chicken breast after your workout, and you're like, oh man, that was like, tough to eat. That was really cool. And you get an hour extra of anti-hunger benefit. Really, really good consideration when hunger starts to really take precedence. Another one is eating later after workouts. So post-workout, ideally, you want to get the fuel in as, sort of, as soon as possible, anti-catabolism, blah, blah, blah. But remember, when adherence is a real problem because hunger is insane, post-workout, your sympathetic drive is still elevated. And all those catecholamines and stuff, they're still in your bloodstream. All those hormones that give you that fight or flight ability, they're still pushing that for, gee, you know, at least half an hour, in some cases, several hours, especially if it's a really difficult workout. So a lot of times you'll notice that like uh, on a muscle gain phase, you'll uh, do your leg workout, you'll come home, you'll sit down for a meal and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to eat this. Like I still want to throw up. I'm not hungry at all. And sometimes you'll shower first. And then by the time you showered, you're like, okay, finally I can stuff this down. You sort of feel bad because you're like, I should have just eaten it right after, but I couldn't. On a fat loss phase, you do the reverse. So you come home and instead of looking at the meal, you go shower. You clean yourself up, you put on deodorant, you brush your teeth, whatever it is you do. Um, your friend texts you and you ask you a question. Answer the question instead of going right to get food. About an hour or so later, maybe a little more, you'll be pretty hungry, but you'll have killed an hour of not being hungry because you just post-workout and you didn't rush to eat right away. Let's say that post-workout meal normally occurs at 5 p.m. Now you eat it at 6 p.m. or 6.15. The next workout was supposed, or next meal is at 8 p.m., usually ravenous by this meal, right? But now this meal is at 6.15. By the time you get to this meal at 8, you're actually sort of still a little bit full from the last one. Then you eat this meal at 8 p.m. and you feel really full and everything's great. You say, but hold on, but aren't you hungry here? No, because you got the anti-workout hunger. I'll put to you this way. If you're at any point during a fat loss diet stuffing yourself at one part of the day and hungry in another part of the day, you could rebalance that so that you're just comfortable all the time. That increases the sustainability of a diet by a zillion, right? Give that some thought. Again, only if hunger is a really, really big concern. On Related to point number one, for eating later after waking, a lot of people, they're just not as hungry in the morning and they get sort of moderately hungry in the afternoon and then their hunger peaks in the evening hours. That's, that's true for probably more people than it's not. So sometimes you can eat more carbs and fats in the p.m. and less in the a.m. 
Maybe you would do this with moving meals around, like timing the meals to occur later, or even without it, you could say instead of like you go to the office and you're super busy, let's say you're an architect, you're doing all these plots, you're talking to management and, you know, lunch comes up and it's only 50 minute lunch because you got a client presentation. Instead of like slogging through a bunch of oatmeal and rice and chicken, you might just take two chicken breasts with you with a couple of greens, wolf them down super quick. You're super busy. You're not hungry anyway. Boom, boom, you get everything done. And then you come home at the end of the day after your training and you're like ravenous because you've eaten not so much through the day and it's the evening you get hungry anyway and your post-workout, but check this out. You got all those carbs and fats that you didn't eat for lunch and maybe the other meals you'd eat throughout the day, you have them now in the evening. And all of a sudden you look at this meal and you're like, oh my God, I have to eat 150 grams of carbs, 25 grams of fat and 65 grams of protein. That's like a serious meal. And especially if you use foods, we'll get to that in a bit in food composition that are really filling. That is a huge meal and you're going to feel like you're not even dieting after that meal. You're going to feel like that for hours and hours and hours. And then you'll have your last meal of the evening again, which is pretty sizable. And you're like, oh my God, you're going to fall asleep with food in your stomach and you're going to sleep super well because when you're satiated, you sleep way better than when you're hungry. We'll get to that point in just a bit as well. So it's a huge big win, right? So consider you don't have to make this huge biasing effort where you take your lunch and you cut all the carbs and you put all these carbs in the later meals. You can take your lunch and maybe cut the carbs in half, right? And then add half the carbs to maybe your other meals or your post-workout meal or something like that. So give that some thought. Last point here on the timing adjustments you, in some really extreme situations of really radical hunger, can take your uh, evening meal or evening shake and put it into the middle of the night. This occurs when you have just enough food in the evening, especially if you buy enough food in the evening, to where you're cutting anyway, and you're working really hard, you're really tired, and you don't have problems falling asleep. Interestingly enough, fat loss dieters usually don't have trouble falling asleep, but sometimes they have trouble staying asleep because they literally wake up dreaming about food and they wake up hungry. Oh boy. So what do you do then? Well, you're in a situation where you have uh, fallen asleep, you wake up three and a half hours later, it's two in the morning, you're too hungry to go back to sleep. What are you supposed to do? But the conventional answer is if you've eaten all your meals, nothing, but then you're losing sleep. Remember, losing sleep is oh, damn near one of the worst things you could do for your training, for your diet, for your psychology, for your longevity, and for sure for your fat loss. Losing sleep's bad. So what could you do? Well, you could take your normal shake and instead of having a casein shake in the evening with some nuts, you take those nuts and you sprinkle them into casein pudding. You save that, you take it in your fridge, you put it in your fridge. If you don't wake up in the middle of the night, no big deal. You have, you didn't eat an extra whatever number of calories that wasn't because, you know, it's close enough on protein anyway, you're not going to lose any muscle, you're fine. But if you do wake up in the middle of the night and you're hungry, all of a sudden, you got maybe just casein, or maybe if you planned it uh, in th this way, casein with nuts sprinkled in, and you can eat that. And as soon as you, you're tired anyway, you wake up in the middle of the night just hungry, as soon as you're not hungry anymore, you eat a nice meal of protein and fats, you're going to get real tired real quick. You're going to fall back asleep. You're going to sleep the rest of the night. You're going to have excellent night's sleep. Voila, you wake up and repeat the next day. Again, if you don't wake up in the middle of the night super hungry and can't fall asleep unless you eat, don't do this. It's not worth uh, messing up your sleep. There's some uh, theoretical reason to believe that you might go better with a fasting period every 24 hour cycle. So you don't want to eat round the clock, which includes at night. Maybe, maybe. But if it's costing you sleep, this is an interesting strategy to try. I've done it numerous times. It works really, really well. Okay. You did all your timing adjustments. How can you adjust food composition as a fat loss diet progresses and gets more difficult? And uh, you want uh, to usually enhance performance or be able to combat hunger. Six ways to do this. Uh, we talked about this already for timing uh, because their intro workout shake stuff goes to the other meals. But basically you remove shakes and use whole foods instead. Whole foods are more filling, open and shut case. When we're looking at what your whole foods are for the carbs, you can start to eat more veggies, fruits, and grains in that order, and fewer, like way more veggies, some more fruits and a bit more grains, and a fewer processed uh, grains, uh, and things like, you know, uh, white rice, cream of wheat, etc. Those things are filling, but not nearly as filling as uh, fruits and veggies and whole grains. For example, if you have 100 grams of carbs to eat in one of your meals, if you eat it from white rice, man, geez, that's like a, you know, two bowls of white rice, like little bowls, at the Chinese restaurant. You're like, you can eat hundred grams of rice. No problem. You're like, oh man, like I'm, I, when you're on a diet, you still want more food. You're like, I, I can eat way more than this. 
If you take 30 grams of carbs, not fiber, because fiber is no calories, not weight, but carbohydrate, and you try to eat that in broccoli, celery, and spinach, that's like this much food. And then you, let's say you use fruits in addition to that, you can do two oranges and then a bit of whole grain pasta. For you to eat all of that would take like half an hour and your stomach would be ballooned up and you'd be super full for hours after. Oh my God, 100 grams of carbs this is crazy, right? That veggies, fruits, and grains are just way more filling. So you can start out, your maintenance diet can be lots of all kinds of carbs, but you want to bias more into the direction of these high fiber carbs, fruits, veggies, and whole grains as your hunger gets more intense. On a very similar note, you can eat foods that are higher in volume. Right, because volume expands your stomach and it signals it to really kind of reduce hunger. So, uh, for example, let's say you eat a lot of dried fruit usually. Well, dried fruit's really, really dense. It has a lot of carbs per per uh, cubic inch or cubic centimeter. And you know, you eat it really quick and boom, you're at 100, 100 grams of carbs already. If you replace dried fruit with just say fresh melon, like fresh cantaloupe, 100 grams of fresh cantaloupe is a bowl roughly the size of cantaloupe. It would take you 20 minutes to eat and you're like, oh my God, I swear to God, I'm just going to blow up, right? And an hour's after you're not hungry and the meal is more enjoyable. So you get a huge stress reduction response versus eating like this much dried fruit and being like, okay, what's next, right? When you're muscle gaining, eating a whole lot of dried fruit is great because it gets you a ton of calories real quick. When you're fat loss, you want to eat the opposite of dried fruit, higher in volume. A lot of that volume comes from water, right? And that is a huge, huge anti-hunger combatant. Another option, and these can all be done at the same time or to some degree, uh, so sort of throughout your diet, you can eat foods higher on the satiety index. Okay, What does that mean? Well, basically foods that fill you up more. Like it's been shown uh, white potatoes that are boiled have a really high satiety per unit of carbohydrate. So if you eat like some dried fruit, you're like, okay, uh, yeah, that was 50 grams of carbs. And people are like, okay, how full are you? You're like, I don't know, I could eat like way more. You eat 50 grams of carbs from white potatoes, and people are like, how full are you? You're like, eh, man, I'm pretty full, right? So you can actually see the satiety index ranked. A lot of it has to do with what fruits, veggies, and whole grains are almost all ranked really, really high in the satiety index. So you look at that, and you pick the foods that just are filling the most. And the thing is, you don't even have to look up any research on that. You already eat a whole bunch of different kinds of foods normally in your diet. You know, some of them fill you up a lot more than others. So as you go through the diet, just eat more of the ones that fill you up a lot for the same amount of food and less of the ones that don't. Probably one of the worst satiety index foods is potato chips. Uh, cheeseburgers, ice cream, junk foods. You can eat a bowl of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and just barely be full. And that's a thousand calories in the whole cheeseburger. Same idea. How many potato chips can you eat? I don't know, maybe an in, in, uh, infinity amount, right? So it's one of the situations where you, you kind of want to, you know, use the foods that fill you up the most and less of the ones that fill you up the least. Huge, huge word of warning. You're going to want to eat the lowest satiety foods psychologically your food seeking behavior is going to be elevated like crazy. Cheeseburgers will never look as good as they do on a diet, but you got to pick the foods that don't quite look as good in order to eat your best. And here's the deal. Super, super ties in to point number five, eat foods lower in FPRH food palatability reward hypothesis basically says super tasty foods make you want to eat more of them when you're on a fat loss diet. Super not so tasty foods you can eat and just kind of get done. So for example, really easy example. Macros and calories are identical. Do you choose flavored oatmeal or unflavored oatmeal? Well, when you have trouble stuffing the oatmeal down and you're on a muscle gain plan, flavored. When you're on maintenance, whichever one you like. When you get deeper and deeper into a fat loss diet, if you flavor your oatmeal, it's gonna you're gonna finish the same amount of oatmeal and because it's flavored, because it's tasty, your brain's like, that was tasty. We want more of that. And it's gonna be really, really tough to resist the cravings, right? You're just basically eating to prime yourself. It's like everything turns into an appetizer. On the other hand, if you eat foods that are lower in FPRH, which doesn't mean disgusting foods, it means foods that are just not exactly the most exciting thing. Um, the sort of most extreme I've gone with FPRH is I used to eat cold oatmeal with cut up chicken breasts and broccoli with salt on it, like all mixed together. It's something that on a muscle gain phase, I would straight up never eat. I'd be like, I can't eat that. I'm going to throw up. On a cutting phase, I was so starved. That that to me tasted not so bad, but I got usually three quarters of the way through the meal and I was like, man, I'm pretty good. And then I just finished the meal super slowly and I wouldn't be hungry for a long time. I certainly wouldn't be rebound hungry. Rebound hungry means like you eat half a brownie and you want triple the amount of brownie you wanted before. 
It would never be real and hungry. I would eat the meal and I'd be like, God, I hope I don't have to eat one of those anytime soon. That's a real good place to be on a diet. Again, instinctually, you're going to want to eat brownies and not oatmeal, chicken breast, and broccoli with salt. Make the right decisions in advance, meal prep, so that you have the food available so it's doing all the good stuff to you and not making you any more anxious and more craving than you have to be. Lastly, and this strategy maybe it isn't super effective, but it works to some extent, is preload fluids before meals. So basically you sit down to eat a meal, take a glass of water, chug that down, it fills up your stomach to some extent, then as you eat the meal, you get fuller earlier, which means you experience a good fullness sensation. If you're at a restaurant where it's sort of like you can keep on eating more food or all you can eat, don't go to those when you're on a fat loss phase, but if you find yourself in one, have a bunch of water before you start, maybe a glass or two. Then you can eat sort of quote unquote whenever you want and just start eating food. You'll find yourself fuller a lot faster, right? A lot sooner, which means you won't eat as much. Really big help. Another one uh, that I have to mention because uh, it, it's it's uh, an interesting uh, theoretical idea. I, I, there's not exactly research to confirm this, but this has worked for me personally and for uh, folks I've been working with really, really well. Salt. Like if you eat plenty of salt, uh, just salt your foods, uh, eat some soups, uh, then on a fat loss diet, you actually, because salt pulls in other water, you actually get more hydrated and you get sort of kind of puffy and uh, you get really full and you don't want to eat for that reason. But I think salt has a lot to do with hunger signaling because some people, when they start to eat diet foods, they'll reduce the salt. And then when they crave foods, they crave really salty foods, a lot of which are junky foods and are super delicious. If you eat bland chicken breast, and uh, an oatmeal or something, you might still want like a cheeseburger or a chip, something with salt. But if you eat that and salt it plenty, after you eat it, you know, the, the macros are still pretty low and well within your diet, but you got so much salt, you had to drink a bunch of water to wash it down. You're like, man, I just, I, I'm pretty good on that. Like I don't need any more food. And you don't, when you're not craving salty foods, that cuts out a whole bunch of junk foods. Right? You could still crave sweet foods, but hey, at least it's half the battle. So give that some thought. Lastly, Supplement adjustments. Most supplements stay exactly the same, right? Sometimes, again, from the past slides, you could cut out your protein shakes, cut out carbs uh, shakes, and do whole foods. But stimulants are the real big supplement you can potentially adjust. How? Well, if you adjust stimulants, what you should be doing is incrementally increasing how much stimulant you take as two things happen. One, as the diet gets more intense, you need more energy from stimulants, you need more cognitive function enhancement, and you need more anti-hunger effect. And two, uh, you get more and more used to the amount of stimulant you're taking. So for that reason, you need to tear your stimulant use up. Here's an example of how that might look if you don't normally take stimulants, but you respond to them fine. Weeks one and two of your fat loss diet, you can do nothing or do green tea in the AM, just a cup of green tea, no big deal. Weeks three and four, you needed a bit more of a kick. You're used to the green tea. You do green tea in the AM and you do green tea pre-workout. This is like if you work out in the afternoon, maybe 5 p.m. or something. Weeks five through six, you need a bit more of a kick. You might do coffee in the AM, green tea pre-workout. Weeks seven through eight, coffee in the AM and coffee pre-workout. Weeks nine through 10, coffee in the AM. And then you might need to take pre-workout powder before your workout, which is like the real deal. You should have a lot of stimulants in it, really get your kick in. And then weeks 11 through 12 to finish off, you do coffee in the AM, pre-workout powder, and in the early PM to get you your last bit of energy and, and fight your hunger, you might do green tea. Notice you don't do like pre-workout twice because you just never fall asleep. Right? So be very careful adjusting this to not interfere with sleep, cut your caffeine earlier in the day, but green tea early in the PM, uh, let's say you finish your workout, you take pre-workout at 2 p.m., you work out at 2.30, you finish at 4, and then at 5 p.m., maybe you have some green tea, and then you finish off the evening. Even some people are so caffeine resistant that you know, at 8 p.m. they could have green tea. It's just enough to fight out hunger a little bit, keep you awake, not enough to keep you awake for too long. And then when 11 rolls around, because you're pretty used to caffeine by this point, or just normally, that little cup of green tea is not doing anything for you. You have your last nice big meal, right, from the earlier adjustments, and you're not caffeined up, you're super satiated from your big meal, and you go to sleep, you have great sleep, you wake up in the middle of the night starving to death, you got your casein pudding with nuts in the fridge, all these adjustments keep you on track, adherence is number one. If you use all these tips or some of them, these are super, super golden tips, they can super help you, and all of a sudden you're one step ahead, you don't have as many breaks in the diet or as many uh, faults with the diet, as many cheat, uh, accidental cheats. Uh, maybe you have none, and then all of a sudden you've accomplished what you need after the diet is over. 
You can keep all of these things in place, but as you eat at maintenance and you eat more and more calories each week as your metabolism revs back up, then you can still pull the plug on some of these. You can reintroduce workout shakes. You can start eating tastier foods slowly so that as you come out of your diet, it's natural. You're never super hungry. And all of a sudden you got to 180 pounds. You've been 180 for three or four weeks now. And all of a sudden it's getting easier. You can eat more normal foods and you've sustainably set yourself up to keep off the weight. Super big success. That's it for this lecture. Next time, myths, misconceptions, and special circumstances in fat loss, our last lecture for the series. Folks, I'll see you then.